Hey, thanks for tuning in to another edition of the Business of Fun Podcast. It's me, Dave Wakeman, your host. I've got some new technology driving this podcast. Let me know if you can hear the difference, not in the audio of this episode specifically, but in this introduction. It's David Dave Wakeman dot com. My guest today is Harold Hughes. He is the CEO of Bandwagon. And we recorded this episode on the day that they released the Ideal Seat product. So we had a lot of fun talking, despite the fact that Harold is a big Clemson guy and I'm an Alabama guy. We managed to get a whole lot of stuff in. Before I tell you a little more about Harold, though, let me talk to you for a second. And let me ask you, how's everybody doing? I know this pandemic continues forward. It's long. It's a slog. It's uncertain. And people are frustrated they are tired they are angry Um, they are probably running through any mix of emotions but if you need somebody to talk to or you just want to share your frustration you just want to talk in general i might even be able to crack a joke send me an email it's david dave wakeman.com and let me know how you're doing Uh, i say this every episode or i try to before since the pandemic has started I want to know how you're doing. I want to check in on everybody. I know this is really difficult on people and it's tough to go through alone. I'm fortunate that I have a whole lot of people that I get to talk to. And if you don't have somebody to talk to, I want to be that person for you. So send me a note. It's Dave at Dave Wakeman.com. Before we get to Harold, I want to point you to a couple of things. Um, some of them are new that I've been working on or that I think need your attention. The first thing I want to point you to is the We Will Recover project. At wewillrecover.live, it is a project put together by my friends at Activity Stream, Anar and Martin, and the entire team. So Sander uh, and all of those people. I'm, now I'm forgetting names because I'm recording this late on a Sunday night, but forgive me. It, the Activity Stream, Martin, Anar have put together this incredible thing called the We Will Recover Project, and it is focused specifically on getting people in live events back on their feet. So there are webinars, there are articles, there are checklists, there's all kinds of stuff, and there will continue to be all kinds of stuff at the We Will Recover website that is specifically focused on revenue, marketing, audience, and getting people back in business. We Will Recover dot live. Check out my friends at Booking Protect. That's www.bookingprotect.com. They have been friends, supporters, colleagues, just great people as long as I've known them. Uh, I don't know that I would continue to do the podcast if it had not been for their support early on. So check them out at bookingprotect.com. But most importantly, go check out the blog. Lately, Sophie and Kieran have been doing great work on the blog and on the Instagram page Um, on the Instagram page, focusing on showing quotes and pictures of events to keep our minds focused on what we're missing out and what we're working towards. Um, It's great at booking protect on Instagram on the blog. There has been a lot of really, really great stuff and there's going to continue to be tremendous stuff focused on recovery focused on revenue, focused on lessons lessons learned. Um, Kat Spencer wrote a really great article about two or three weeks ago about relationships and relationships coming out of the pandemic, which is super important. Sophie has been working on a series of articles about best practices and lessons learned from the pandemic, especially things that people can use now. So keep an eye on bookingprotect.com and look for the blog. And if you're on the social media and you go to the Instagram Make sure you give them a follow there, too. Um, The picture of Marshmallow was great. I loved it. Uh, My son, Cormac, he loves it. It's awesome. Make sure that you check out. This is a whole new thing that I just started talking about last week. But this is going to be one of the things I spend the most time on over the next, I think, two and a half to three months. Uh, Former podcast guest. Lawrence Purrier is on the board of this organization called I Voted Concerts. It's at IVotedConcerts.com. The hashtag is I Voted Concerts. Uh, he introduced me to a woman called Emily White who founded the thing. I like to say that Emily lives her life with an exclamation point. Um, the focus of the organization is a bipartisan effort to get more Americans to vote. Americans vote at a lower rate 
compared to the rest of the industrialized world. And I've always felt that the most important thing that you can do, the price of admission for a democracy is voting. So visit IVotedConcerts.com. You can make sure you're registered to vote. You can find out where to vote. You can find out how to vote early. You can find out all kinds of things. And the reward is there are tons of artists. Um, we're working on athletes, celebrities who are doing concerts, doing um, videos, doing all kinds of things to reward people for making sure you practice the most fundamental element of living in a democracy, which is voting. So go to IVotedConcerts.com. Make sure you can register to vote. Make sure you do everything you can to make sure people vote this year. It's super important. It's important no matter when there's an election. I freaking vote in every election. So um, check it out. If you can support the effort by giving money, by giving your time, by giving your effort, do it and tell them I sent you. Okay? IVotedConcerts.com. Make sure also you get my newsletter. If you've gotten this far in the introduction, you probably are interested in the Talking Tickets newsletter, which is my ticketing newsletter. It's at talkingtickets.substack.com, and it is five stories. Every Friday morning, talking about the world of tickets. I analyze these trends or big stories, talk about what actions you can take to make money uh, or to gain an advantage. Talkingtickets.substack.com. It's great. People love it. It is probably um, comes back as one of the most rewarding things I do during the week. It helps me keep focused on staying in touch with the industry. It's great. People love it. I love it. You'll love it. Get it. Especially now you're going to need it um, because as we move forward, we're going to need all the ideas we can get. So talkingtickets.substack.com. Now back to Harold. Harold Hughes is the CEO of Bandwagon. As I said before, he also went to Clemson, so we won't hold that against him. Uh, I have been doing a survey in the Talking Tickets newsletter about things that everybody needs or wants to learn more about or wants to figure out heading out of the pandemic. So people suggested people I should have on the podcast. Harold came up. I was like, why haven't I had Harold on before? Because it's not like we don't know each other and we're not friendly. Um, so we had Harold on. And it was great because, you know, they had the ideal seat product to talk about. And it's kind of like an Eventbrite competitor. And so we talk about that. We talk about bourbon, uh, which is also a topic that we talk about quite regularly in the Talking Tickets Slack channel. Uh, but we, we we covered a lot of stuff. We talked about, um, you know, how is, what his leadership style looks like, what his management style looks like, you know, how he's led his team through the pandemic, which is something I've been really interested in because, I don't think we can take good leadership for granted and a trend that I didn't even know I was getting to has been, I've been able to talk to these people who have really put their people first during the pandemic. And there's a lot of times we don't see those stories. So I've been really happy about the ability that I've had to talk to people about really the way that they've been able to support their employees and help them get through this. Um, so that was really, really important to me. And that really, really struck with me. Um, and it's um, really a trend that I've heard um, over and over and over again from uh, from the people I've been talking to is about how they've been able to support their employees and help them get through the pandemic because it hasn't been easy on evil people. Uh, then we talked about, you know, how they continue to develop the product, how they grow the product, how they innovate the product. Uh, Innovation is super important right now. Um, I believe that the ticket industry and the ticketing technologies, they're going to face a change. Things are going to be different when we finally are able to start moving out of the pandemic. Um, so innovation, being closer to the customer, uh, being more responsive to the customer is going to be a huge plus for people. And so we talk about that. We talk about the, um, you know, how they got into the business, you know, how the business has evolved over the years. We talked about, you know, how you can create an environment where people take action. We talked about, um, you know, the like I said before, the ideal seat pro, uh, product and how they were able to create some kind of white label personalized offering to people, uh, something that will allow people to um, have a better experience, even if the tickets are free. Um, it was a really great conversation. I think you're going to like Harold um, 
and what he was talking about. It was really, really good to have a chance to talk to Harold in the context of a podcast so that like some of the things that I know about him and that we have talked about and shared over the years are able to come out in a way that you can hear about him. So here's my conversation with Harold Hughes from Bandwagon on the Business Fun Podcast. I want to welcome Harold Hughes to the Business of Fun podcast. Harold, let me tell you, you were one of the most requested guests when I was doing my survey. So <laughs> thank you for doing this. That's People, awesome. Um, way to set a high bar. I hope I live up to expectations. Well, you, I'm sure you will. Uh, it's usually me who lives down to the expectations. Um, it was also funny because I said, oh, People were like asking for these people, and I was like, "Oh, if you want to hear from them, I'll ask them." And then, you know, like it's like you, and then there's uh, Mark from Audience View, and they're like, "Well, man, usually we fill out these surveys, and nothing ever happens." So I'm glad to prove people wrong. Um, So thank you for doing this. I think this is going to be great um, because you have gone through number one today, just by coincidence, you're uh, launching a new Ideal Seat website. Um, So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but then the other thing we were talking about as we were getting ready to start recording was you were talking to me about leadership and, you know, having to pivot. And, you know, uh, I believe we use several buzzwords, uh, unprecedented, uncertain, all these different times, yeah. like things that are just completely screwed up that we had no way to plan for. Um, and so I think this is going to be awesome. Um, but let's start out by talking about um, let's talk about leadership to start with, because I think that'll uh, flow through the stuff about ideal seat and the stuff that bandwagon. Um, what has been your leadership philosophy and how have you dealt with being a leader of a team during, you know, a pandemic, a financial crisis, uh, civic unrest? Um, uh, now, like there's like a, a tropical storm bearing down on D.C. as oh, I'm doing this, sure. you know, yeah. uh, low, uh, was it plague, low, low, locusts, <laughs> fire yeah. and brimstone, the whole deal. How are, how are you doing that? Like, what's your philosophy been? Yeah, I mean, it's been I've been fortunate because I spent about a decade in corporate America. And in that, I've been able to witness different people's management styles. Some are very, um, you know, on you to make sure you're doing something their way. Others are really concerned about your mental health. And so I've I've really been able to find a blend of um, the things that I loved about my favorite managers and the things that I wish I would have had from managers that weren't as great to me as I, I would have wanted. And so for us, it's been I've really emphasized mental health, flexibility, um, and freedoms. And so for context, um, obviously being in the live event space, that second week of March, things start shutting down. Uh, The company's headquartered in Greenville, South Carolina, but I'm here in Austin. Uh, South by Southwest gets canceled, and you know that this is going to become a major thing. The NBA suspends the season. And so my team, we had literally just uh, signed a multi-year lease at a new office and headquarters in Greenville uh, in February, so a month before, um, and moved in. And uh, I told the team, I was like, hey, folks, you know, let's, let's go home. So I actually told the team, let's everyone go home, take whatever you need from the office, whether that was their standing desk or their expensive ergonomic chairs to help with them, help them there. But from there, we really started running some challenges. And I'm not sure that this is unique to us, but we ran into challenges where people were not sleeping great. So they would be waking up late for meetings or not getting a great night's sleep or really finding it hard to balance out like work time versus non-work time, um, feeling some peace there. And so we did a couple of things from a leadership standpoint. Uh, Number one, um, we moved our normal 9 a.m. stand up meeting to 11 a.m. Um, that was really because we felt like if you're up until two or three o'clock in the morning, I still want you to get those seven hours of rest that you need, eight hours of rest. Um, and if you aren't and you're still waking up on time like normal, then you can just work on whatever you need to work on or early on. So that was that was one of the things is making sure we moved the meetings a little later and we added an afternoon check in. It was more of like a water cooler. Uh, my team was five of us. And for the most part, you know, we were the only human beings each other were seeing throughout the week. And so when you lose that human interaction, uh, we needed to add that back in there. Um, Another thing we did was we added, uh, we gave them a cash bonus. I gave the team a cash bonus to go and buy something that would help being at home uh, be a little bit better. Like one of our team members bought a hammock so he could enjoy more of outside. Um, And so really it was up to them to do whatever they wanted. So I really wanted to focus on not only the mental health aspect of making sure they're getting rest and being able to be dynamic, but also the flexibility of providing the resources we were going to have at the office for them to have at home. So those are the two main things 
uh, or three main things we made sure to uh, emphasize in the beginning here. I don't think those are small things, though, because this idea that people weren't sleeping very well, I can only speak for myself, but that was absolutely true because, you know, your whole world's upended and you, you know, you know, there's no rhyme or reason to the way your day flows before. Right. Right. It's like it used to be, um, even if I'm, you know, not the most rigid in my scheduling because, you know, I like to give myself a lot of white space in the day. It's still like, I mean, you, you kind of wake up, you're at home, you go to bed, you're at home. You yep. can't just go like even go out for a walk to go to like get a cup of coffee or, yep. you know, like I would use the, the gym, right. To break up the day. I mean, so that, that's not an insignificant thing to recognize. I mean, I can tell you um, without naming any names that there's still companies that are, what are we now, four or five months into this thing? And they still have not recognized the mental health toll that's, being, that's taking place for their people. And they haven't yeah. recognized the difficulty of, you know, being at home and working from home combined yeah. with child care situations and combined with all these other stressors that are going on. So that's not necessarily insignificant. Um, sure. Also, the thing about a hammock, that sounds awesome. I may go get yeah. one after we get done. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, and it was one of these things where I was literally trying to think of the most creative way. So when I was like, okay, you know, during while people are losing their jobs in the country, I'm very fortunate that our team was small enough. We were in a cash position to not only keep everyone on and not change any salaries, but to give them some cash to buy something to where they've got some sanity at home was really, really important to me. Uh, but then we started adding in all these random little other things. Like we had a virtual uh, baking class. Um, you know me. You know I love to cook. And hopefully we'll talk a little bit about some grilling uh, later. But you know, <laughs> we had a virtual banana bread cooking class where we worked with this um, local business called Home Sweet Home. They prepackaged everything from the bananas to the eggs to the butter, the container, the spoon, and shipped it and delivered it to everyone. Um, and so went on Zoom and showed us, like, okay, you're going to – fold this in, you're going to add this, you're going to stir all of this. And then each of us had our own like delicious banana bread um, for ideal seat getting launched today. I had um, them go deliver mimosas and screwdrivers so they could have a little toast this morning to announce that. Cause it was, you know, it was a big thing for us. So I think that trying to find ways to create that same sense of community, but also being mindful that um, we have to do these things differently is huge um, when it comes to leadership right now. Yeah, and don't worry, we were, we'll we'll talk about barbecuing and meats. Don't worry, we're <laughs> totally going to get to that. Right. <laughs> I, I mean, it, to me, this is very heartening because, like, a lot of times, I think what happens is, as Americans, right, and I'm going to make a broad generalization here, is that um, most of the time when I'm traveling in other countries, they say, oh, you, the Americans, you're way too hard driving, and, like, you don't pay enough attention to the people. And me, uh, I mean, you know me well enough to go like, because we were joking about it before. It's like I have created this persona and this uh, thing around me that where it's like it's totally cool for me to check in on people and just be like, yo, how you doing? Right. And it's like completely. Um, and so I've always recognized how important the people are. Um, and it's still something I work at doing a lot. But it's nice to hear somebody else in a leadership position to recognize, A, it's it's tough on people. B, you're going to have to adjust the way you're dealing with things. And C, taking action on it. Because I think we, everybody talks about it. But it's like what, when you follow through, it's very, very important. Um, yeah. But I'm kind of curious because you talked about doing the stand-up. So that would lead me to believe that like your, your team follows more of an agile process. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And so we – Oh, go, oh, go ahead. ahead. You know, I was going to say, well, I was going to ask you kind of what have you learned and like what has like, um, you know, been kind of shocking or surprising uh, in both positive and negative way from, you know, this this period where everybody you're still running an agile workforce, but you're st- also distanced from each other. Yeah. So from an agile standpoint, it was really important for our CTO, um, Hampton. He put in uh, place these weekly sprint reviews or sprint uh, sprint sessions. So on Monday morning, we all get together the first meeting of the week is a sprint uh, planning uh, meeting where we all talk about what our goals for that week are. And each of us kind of takes time either, whether it's the end of the previous week or before that meeting on Monday morning, to make sure that we kind of set our own goals of what we need. And then in that shared meeting, that's when we say, well, I need to work on this. So Brittany, I may need you to tap in to help me. Or Joe, can I help you with anything to remove any roadblocks? And so that collaborative session allows us to not only share what we're going to be individually working on, but then also ask for help for that week. And then at the end of the week, every Friday afternoon, the last meeting of uh, our week, we have the sprint review and team meeting where we say, okay, show and tell. What did you build? And if you can't show it, you didn't build it. 
Um, sometimes it's something that's not super sexy, like testing um, and QA. Um, and other times it's an entire new website and so or an entire new product uh, interface. Um, and so being able to run that has been really, really great. Um, and then we have um, the ability, we, we use um, you know various tools to try and make sure we're staying connected, Slack, uh, Pivotal, and all these different things to make sure we're, we're sharing information, but also staying connected. Well, let me ask you this, because number one, how did you create a culture that enabled people to feel free and feel confident to ask for help? Because I know that's a struggle for people sometimes to ask for help because they feel like not having the answer is some sort of deficiency, right? Um, Mm -hmm. And I think we probably agree that that's not necessarily true. Asking a question is how you learn. So, you know, so how did you create that? And then the second thing is, you know, inside this agile environment, right? Because I think sometimes people think it's like a free for all, you know, Mm -hmm. how do you, um, you know, how do you keep the, you know, the businesses focus, you know, on the right task or right opportunities uh, in an agile environment? Because, you know, I know from talking with a lot of people, you know, oh, I'm worried that if I give people too much freedom to work on these different projects, that it gets out of hand. Yeah. Well, I mean, so I'll I'll answer the first question first. Um, For us in the hiring process, we make sure to emphasize uh, what type of people we're looking for. And one of the things I talk about, you know, I'm not the technical person on the team. I'm business, I'm vision, I'm um, strategy. Uh, I let Hampton handle the technical stuff. But in the interview, I tell people that um, it is my job to put together the Avengers uh, to make a superhero reference. And it would be useless for us to have 10 people that all have the same superpower. And so my superpower specifically is knowing my strengths and knowing my weaknesses. I'm incredibly introspective when it comes to uh, being able to not only assess my own skills and and traits, uh, but also figuring out from a team dynamic where we're missing, where can we be beefed up and who's really better at one thing than the other. And so in that is part of like the hiring process, part of the interview process, is part of the team process. Um, I think that we've been able to not only identify team members that are um, that each have their own superpower and know that we're stronger together as a team and a collaborative, but also I'm able to check in and say, hey, like we were on the team meeting today and we're doing them via video and you looked a little down. Is everything cool? And you can check and say, actually, you know, last night was pretty rough or, you know, this is what I'm dealing with and being being very interested in their well-being. One thing that we talk about as a company is that like, you know, and I obviously said this is people talk about work-life balance. Uh, At Bandwagon, we don't do work-life balance. We do work-life prioritization. And when you're at work, I want you to be at work and I want you delivering and driving towards our business goals. But when you're not at work, I want you to be enjoying yourself, whether that's with family and loved ones, working on personal uh, development or any of those different things. But we also understand the connection between the life um, and the personal and how that can impact your work. And so as we talk about the prioritization, Number one is always the life and the personal and the family, because if that stuff's not good, work's not going to be good. And so that's really kind of how we, we go about that. Um, to the second part about you know making sure everyone stays on um, and focused and is able to execute, um, one thing that we've kind of coined is that the same way that Google has you know 20% time, we're not in the position where we can have that as um, like a built-in thing, but we do allow for like passion and pride projects. So if you're working, if you're interested in something and you want to dedicate a few cycles to it, we're absolutely happy to support you, uh, whether that's, you know, us investing in like some seminar or some training to help you get to that next level. Um, but at the same time, when we look at the ice chest of the things we want to work on, um, each person kind of gets to raise their hand and say, oh, I'd like to tackle that. And I have experience in product A or experience in skill A. I don't know as much about B. So let me pick up a little bit of B so that I can get sharper on that. And so I think that, um, you know, I'm, I'm incredibly fortunate to have the team we have. We're actually hiring right now for another engineer. And so we want to continue to build and cultivate that type of um, mindset, not only in individuals, but also um, as a unit. No, I, I, that's great, too. And I think, um, you know, for people, that's probably going to be very helpful for them to hear because, Sure, you have Agile and there's like a lot of flexibility, but there's still like, look, we got priorities. We got to hit those things. And I think that's where uh, we were talking about this. We were joking before. It's like everybody tells us we need to learn how to prioritize things and nobody tells us how to do it. And I think like, you know, it is a constant process, um, you know, of figuring out what should be the priority and putting some effort behind that. 
Yeah, and that's one of the things I, I always tell my technical team. Their job is to tell me what they can do, and then it's my job to decide what we should do. So they are the could team, and we and I am the should team um, right now. And so ultimately, it's saying like, all right, Harold, if we've got this many cycles, we can either deliver this feature, these two features, or a blend of this setup. And I'm like, all right, we really need this feature, or we need to support this customer in this way, so let's prioritize that way. So I think we've got a really good balance on uh, splitting up the shoulds and coulds. Yeah, and one more thing on this uh, leadership thing, and then we'll talk about tickets and like all the stuff you guys are working on. Uh, the, this idea of work-life prioritiz- prioritization, to me it makes a lot of sense because, and, and I'll be curious to get your feedback on this, because what I've found over the years, and this is something that I had to teach myself um, and I am in the constant process of teaching myself is to focus on the outcome. What's the, yep. the result I want to produce and not the amount of time that it takes me to get there. Because sometimes mm-hmm. I can get something done in 10 or 15 minutes because I've done it a hundred times that might take other people an hour. And because I've set myself up that way, it's really, really great. Um, and what I guess I want to do is I want to put a stake through the heart of the billable hour. <laughs> uh, but how, how did you come up, you know, I want to hear about it through your eyes and like how that kind of manifests itself in your organization, because I think it's very important to, especially in a situation like this, to be like, as long as you get done with these three things every day, you've had a successful day because there's a ballooning of commitments. There is a, people are overwhelmed if, even if they're not expressing it, um, you know, structuring your time, like we were talking about before. And even you mentioned if you're up till two working on something, it makes it really difficult to get your rest and take care of yourself. You know, how yeah. do you express that now? And like, how do you, you know, I want to hear you describe it a little bit so that it's not just me going, focus on the outcomes. Don't be a jerk. Well, yeah, well, I, I think <laughs> it's, I think it's been, um, I think it's important in leadership. One of the things I try and talk about is, you know, it is not my job to inspire my team. Like I would like to think that we're building a company that aligns with uh, what they want to build and, and therefore they'll stay with us and we're going to provide the right compensation package and work environment to keep those you know folks happy in there. Um, but it's my job to give them the information, to give them transparency. And I think that not only from a you know culture of our company standpoint, uh, but that's also what we want to build into our products. And so when I think about equipping you with transparency and information that allows you to do whatever job it is you need to do, um, the other part of that is me also understanding that there are some um, invisible challenges that you are currently carrying. And so before COVID-19, before Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and all that's going on from the um, civic side and the Black Lives Matter movement, like a lot is going on in the context of mental capacity is just lower right now. Whether it's childcare, I'm fortunate I'm the only one on my team. Um, Well, actually myself and Baria are the only ones that have kids at home. And it is a challenge Fortunately, the engineering folks don't have kids at home, and so it's allowed them to have a little bit more flexibility, but then they have their own challenges because then they're not seeing anyone at home or maybe just their significant other. And so um, the thing that we've looked at is like, yes, we focus on outcomes and setting a goal, and then it's like, okay, did we meet this goal? Okay, where where do we fall short? So expectation setting is huge for us, and we want to make sure we emphasize the outcome and what is the minimum viable uh, piece to that outcome. And so it's like, you know, even with us rolling out Ideal Seed today, we know it's not perfect. It's available for public beta, but we know that we need to get something out there so we can start getting feedback from folks. And so if we kept pushing and pushing our team to deliver a perfect product amid all that's going on in their their mind space, uh, I think that would probably be doing a disservice not only to um, the individual team members, but to the products uh, that we're trying to deliver and to the company that we're trying to build. Yeah, I think that idea, too, that you're going to deliver a perfect product is something that holds a lot of people back. Um, yeah. And we didn't even talk about this before when we were brainstorming what we were going to talk about. There's no such thing as a perfect product because nope. the only thing, you know, you maybe get 80% of what you really think you need. Send that thing out into the world. And then people are going to tell you whether or not they like it or don't like it. They're going to react to things, right? It's, I mean, go ahead. Well, yeah, but I mean, I mean, it's actually, and it's even better than that. Like, not only you could build eighty percent of it and then deliver it, if you put it in the hands of users, smart people will show you how they actually want to use it. I mean, we hear like, I mean, TikTok is a company that's currently being talked about all over the news in various cycles. When they put it out, and then users actually got their hands on it, you found that like, oh, this is what people want to do with this product. Um, and so when you think through like 
you and your five person team or you and your 20 person team trying to build a product and then release it. You have to understand that when you've got thousands of customers or millions of customers, that they are smart too. And they're going to say, oh, actually, this product is meant to do this. And so the longer you take incubating it in that five or 10 person team, especially when you think about diversity, you think about uh, biases and all these different things, you're missing out on perspective that these customers have. So, you know, whoever's listening to this, ship the product, like ship it. Ship yeah. it in. <laughs> I, I agree. I, you know, people will be like, oh, you, you, you have so many ideas. And I go, well, I don't know what's going to work. Right. right. You know, it's like I don't have some magic wand. If anything, if I'm right more than I'm wrong, it's just because I've failed so much in like it, on things that I thought were going to be hits and they didn't. And I just am unafraid of like shipping something and not having it work the way I want. Right. It's yeah. I do the – and this is before. I haven't done them now because I haven't been able to leave my house in six months. Um, but, I, you know, like last year I launched workshops, right? I would go do workshops in all these cities. And by the time I got to the last one I did before the um, lockdown in Australia, I had gotten a lot better at it because I saw how pe- what people wanted, what people needed. The first one, though, was like for five or six people. But it was great because as soon as I did, I learned what was valuable for people. Yeah. And what I thought was, was how people were going to use these things and benefit, it was completely like nobody gave it. Nobody cared at all. It was exactly. <laughs> just like whatever. They were like, this is what we want from you. And I was like, well, let me give you that. Then I can do that. <laughs> yep. That's, and that is all it is. That is all. Ship it. Whoever's listening to this. Ship it, do that thing, get it out there in front of customers. Yeah. There, uh, the great thing about being an American in this regard is that like, we have a high threshold for failure, right? Because you, if you make a mistake and you do something wrong, we will give you the opportunity to come back from it. It's not like you only have one shot. You know, it's the people who aren't taking shots that are like the ones not having success. Right, and I want to definitely normalize that, especially as like a black American and a black founder and entrepreneur and understanding like those shots on goal and having those opportunities to fail um, aren't necessarily afforded at an equal rate to black people, people of color, women. And so I do think that, you know, we do need to think very inclusively about how as Americans we emphasize how do we help make sure people are able to take big, bold risks, um, knowing that they can fail. Like I'm a person that often acknowledges the privilege I have to even be starting a company because I'm well networked and I have degrees and I'm sure I could probably find another thing if bandwagon went belly up. And so that's why I have to be, that's why I try. I think that it's my duty to take that risk. And I'd like to hope that people who look like me uh, are able to get a second chance and we look at how America can really emphasize that. So I'm, I'm super excited about what entrepreneurship means. I'm super excited about what is going to come of ticketing and what new uh, innovations we're going to have in all of this stuff uh, based on the challenges we're all f- facing together right now. Yeah. I mean, and this is not necessarily um, something I bring up a whole lot, but like part, one of the foundations of what I do, because for the most part, it's always been around revenue and marketing and strategy and, and really how to, how to capture and create opportunities is that, that thing that you talked about entrepreneurship and like having people know that like, failing is okay and that like every opportunity doesn't look the same because like you were talking about being a black man who's an american and a founder and like people not necessarily always seeing somebody like you take chances or taking swings that's like something that's really driven me because you know i don't always talk about it a lot but when i was a kid in northern georgia right like outside of athens i was the minority i was the only white kid on my bus so like i've always like felt um really strongly about that like i want everybody to have the opportunity to succeed because I recognize what I saw, what it was like to be not, you know, not in the majority and like, so not take these things for granted. So then it makes it like, I want to see everybody succeed. Right. Cause I I was like on stability is like something that's at a, um, at a premium these days. And, you know, and I know like entrepreneurship and being able to um, generate revenue and, you know, create opportunities for yourself is one of the things that helps you create that stability. And, you know, it's, You know, to me, it's very, very important. And so, like, yeah. you know, helping people do that is, like, something that I love because, I mean, I just, in general, I, the reason I do all this stuff is because I just love being able to talk to people and, like, learn from them. It's, like, yeah. so exciting to me. I, I, it's great. I call love, me, I love, a, call me love. a nerd, but, like, I just love, like, learning from people and talking to people. So. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about bandwagon and ideal seat then, because we talked about, we, we, we talked a lot of leadership. We laid a foundation. And one of the things that you said, in the lead into this, 
was that um, you know you've had you had to really adjust what bandwagon was up to because of the shutdown on live live events. Um, walk us through that a little bit because I think you know knowing what the new positioning is and knowing what the challenges or how you tackle the challenges is probably going to be very useful to the people who are listening to this podcast because I yeah. think a lot of venues, a lot of teams, a lot of organizations that sell tickets or like are trying to welcome people back to their venues are struggling with what does what's next look like? Yeah, no, I mean, I think what next, you know, for us to tell the story about what's next, I got to tell a little bit about how we started, you know, as a first generation American to Jamaican parents. Um, we didn't have a lot of money growing up. We were never, we were never homeless. My parents were always able to provide that, but you know, power was off or water was off or food stamps or all these different social services and government services, thankfully. Um, and we always, there were times where we didn't have the resources we needed, but on the soccer field or on the basketball court, we were on a level playing field. And now I'm, I'm more acknowledging the fact that we are also able-bodied, which is another privilege we have. But we were able to run around with these kids from different economic backgrounds, different religions, different race, uh, different gender. And so I always loved sports because I thought it brought people together. I always uh, use this example saying, you know, the most segregated our country is, is on Sunday mornings from the different religions to different socioeconomic uh, status in those uh, groups to race and all these different um, setups. But when you think about college football on Saturday, the melting pot that's in that audience or baseball on the Sunday afternoon in these various major cities, you've got people who are coming from various backgrounds, various professions, various religions and genders and socioeconomic uh, positions as a big group. And so when we started Bandwagon um, early on, we initially wanted to just help fans have a better experience. And like that was really the North Star. And so we started Bandwagon as a ticketing marketplace specifically to compete with StubHub. So for anyone who's listening, I'm sure everyone is familiar with StubHub. Uh, you could list your ticket and have it be resold to another person, but there's no way to control it. And so protect home field advantage was impossible. So in college football, I'm a Clemson grad. You know, solid orange is really important. So we bandwagon and allow you to say, hey, you can list your ticket from the comfort of your home. No more having to meet another Clemson grad or Clemson fan in a parking lot or at a gas station. You can list it the same way you would on StubHub, but with a little check of a button, you could say, sell this ticket to a fan of my team in hopes of preserving that home field of, um, advantage, but also in making the experience better for the person who's showing up. And I don't know if anyone, uh, Dave, you maybe you've got some experience with this. Nothing is worse than being at a great event, whether your team is winning or losing and being surrounded by the other team's fan. And they're, it's obnoxious and it's an awful personal experience. And so it's literally two different things. That Alabama doesn't know. lose that often, so I don't really. <laughs> <laughs> that, we'll talk about Alabama and Clemson. Too. Yeah. But I think it's so interesting that, like, as an event organizer, you've got to control for not only the product that's on the field or on the court, but also for the experience of the individuals in the stands. And so when we were starting to get started, uh, we were doing that, and we ran into problems. We said, well, the ticket market – um, it's low margin. We didn't have the cash we needed to basically buy in to pay with the uh, play with the folks we wanted to play with. And so they said, you know, have you ever thought about trying to be you know, complimentary to a stub hub? And at that point, we really took a step back and said, well, what are the real challenges in the industry? And so back in 2017, we pivoted saying we're going to shut down our B2C fan facing ticket marketplace and we're going to become a B2B data company that aggregates all of these different ticket marketplaces so that the event organizer actually knows who's in the venue. So if Dave is buying the ticket on day zero, but he ends up selling it to Melissa and their demographics are slightly different, that may matter a little bit if it happens once. But if it happens a thousand times or 10,000 times, you have to think about how different your marketing could be or how different your sponsorship opportunities could be or your overall products and services. So, you know, coming into 2020, we had positioned the company as a fan identity and attendee analytics solution where we were going to work with live event organizers, sports teams, festivals uh, with our main product, Aura, to help them know who's in the venue on the day of the event, regardless of who got there. But as we started to go and get ramped up and heard uh, rumblings about some of this stuff in early Q1, we said, well, what are some other ways that we can use the data and the tech that we have? And so that's when we took a step back and said, well, you know, fan identity is just identity. Uh, like, why don't we zoom out and just try and deliver this solution for anyone, whether it's um, a restaurant that's trying to control capacity in their space or a live event that's trying to figure out uh, their ticketing. Let's zoom out. And so 
when COVID really started to, to impact the business, we really look at it and said, we can position ourselves as an identity infrastructure company. We're going to build niche market solutions that focus on these various sectors. Um, and our whole goal is to ultimately help folks experience better. Like that's the tagline of the company. And experience is still the thing that we were wanting to do in 2014. But we understand that there's a disconnect between being able to actually deliver better experiences if you don't know who's there. So you can think about like the last gift a loved one has given you and how much you really wanted it and how much they knew you needed it versus you doing like a white elephant Christmas swap with your coworkers or your friend group. And you end up with like a generally useful gift. That's how most events feel because of how ticketing is set up today. It's like, oh, it's an extra large t-shirt. Great. But it's not curated. It's like, oh, well, I'm a 2X or I'm a medium or I like this. And so being able to really, I think, focus on who's actually in the venue and then deliver curated and personalized experiences is like kind of how we got here. Um, and that's, I think that, you know, our main focus is to like, how do we help the country get back on track? How do we connect people in a time where people want to help get connected? And I think that's really where it starts is allowing folks for personalization. Well, I, I think there's two, I have two questions here. And the first one is you, you talked about, you don't really know who is here, so you can't really create the best experience for folks. And what it sounds like to me you're describing is how you take this thing, um, which if I had exclamation points, I could put it on the screen, but this is audio only. It would be big data, and then I would tell everybody to drink, right, because everybody talks about big data. It's mm -hmm. actually taking all this data that you have and actually being able to funnel it down in a way that is meaningful because yeah. – the big data thing is great and all, except for the fact that we're overwhelmed with data and nobody knows yeah. exactly how to make it useful. And so then exactly. it just becomes something we have like uh, – I don't even know of a good example right now, so I won't even torture this example anymore. <laughs> um, but you know, it's like if you can't take action on it, it's worthless. And so like this sounds like I really uh, – you're, you're taking that – um, big data and you're funneling it into something that's actionable and useful for folks because for sure. we're seeing right now at a, at a probably like a meaningful way that big data is great except for the fact that like uh, small data is what matters because you got to be able to pinpoint if Harold goes to a restaurant to pick up uh, takeout for his family and he comes in contact with somebody who has happens to have the coronavirus we need to be able to not find all 100 people that have been in that restaurant for the last week. We need to be able to find the people who are engaged with that one person. That's not big data. That's small data, and it's right. meaningful so that the experience is more valuable. Yeah. Um, well, I think that that's – and it's really about the paralysis of analysis is kind of the thing. If you, you Everyone talks about, like, oh, we have so much data, but we don't know what to do with it. You know, I remember, um, you know, what was the saying where it's like data is king and then – content became king like curation is king like that's the truth curation is king because whether you have data and whether you have content that's fantastic but if you're unable to curate it as we see with what's happening with quibi and their content or whatever is going on if you can't curate and personalize that experience and deliver it to your audience or find that audience and give them what they want you're going to miss out and your bottom line and top line are going to be way off yeah and that's awesome too because curation is king. I I, I will steal that probably because yeah. for the thing for me has always been the context is always the king. So I think they're like hand in hand with each other. And the second thing that I was want to ask about before we went off on big data so that I could like go off on one of my little normal rants about going the big data doesn't matter. It's like you know right. it's con everything in context. But what it does reflect and what the pivot you've made it reflects a realization though that. Um, often is missed, I think, that you're not just competing if you're a sports team. You're not just competing against um, the TV. You're competing against all these other things that people are calling it, defining experiences. And the point I try to make pretty regularly is that you don't define what the best experience is or you don't define what the competition is. Your customer does. And so you have to understand what they are picking besides you. And if I'm not mistaken – you know, understanding through your lens the, you know, what you're working on, it gives you a greater power to understand exactly what people are doing or want to do or where they're putting their attention as opposed to like just assuming it's if I'm not going to the Wizards game, then I'm probably watching the Wizards game on TV, which is probably not likely. Or am I, right. am, am, I, am, I, am I wrong? No, I think that's spot on. I think that the biggest thing that we look at is the fact that 
most so so this is normal people make decisions based on the data that they have present right so for any sports organization or a festival or anyone you're likely to make decisions based on the data you have available what our philosophy is is we've kind of coined this as a glass box technology strategy and that's really juxtaposing the black box which is this obscure secure thing where it's like oh, we put our data in it and we have no idea what's in it but we know it's safe with glass box saying it's protected we have transparency but we know what's in it, is that we often think, oh, we should make decisions based on the data we have available, which is great. But what we think is, is that there are some other stakeholders that have valuable data that if you were able to take a couple pieces of it, you would have a better chance at making a better decision. And so what we find is that some folks just think that their data set is a treasure map when in actuality, it's a small puzzle piece in a greater, bigger picture. And once you open up your mind to understanding that I may not have enough information to make the, the best and most optimal decision, but if I'm willing to share my puzzle piece and so-and-so shares their puzzle piece, we'd actually get to a, a better roadmap together. And that's really all it comes down to is that how can we use data from various places to help these organizations make better decisions on how to personalize experience, deliver better products and services. And so, you know, as again, when we look at bandwagons as experience better, like that's our tag, it's important for us to emphasize like experience can be everything from a live event to your shopping experience on an e-commerce platform, to how you interact with your state and local government. Um, like we want people to have better experiences overall. And I think that the biggest disconnect between that is the expectation that's set when we don't know who that actual identity of that user is. Yeah, no, I think that there, you know, the technology and the data and all these things that we have available to us, they, they're, they're so powerful. And I, don't, I think um, in the States compared to the rest of the world, I think, we have lulled ourselves into a belief that like, oh, we're doing everything we possibly can with the, with technology. And it's not true. Um, and, and there's so much opportunity and there's so many things that technology can do to improve our lives. The challenge is we have to be willing to recognize where we're deficient and be willing to ask better questions about what we want the outcomes to look like and be prepared to invest the effort that's necessary in creating those outcomes. Yeah. That's just me. There's another rant for you. So, you know, <laughs> you're, you're good for two at least. <laughs> That's perfect. That's perfect. Man. I, I agree. I definitely agree. Yeah. I mean, I, cause I love, I mean, again, I love, love the technology and I love um, the potential of technology and it's just like whether or not it gets used properly. Cause I know there's like so many great tools that don't always get used properly. And so like when you're talking about, you know, all the, you know, taking a one puzzle piece and connecting all these puzzle pieces together, I mean, People are spending so much money on on events and so much on experiences. Like, there's so much opportunity because I think that you know, not right now. Now it's a bad example, but in general, one of these days, everybody will be able to go back out to bars and nightclubs and restaurants and sporting events and all these things, and they will spend money because we've been spending money on these things for thousands and thousands of years. This is like right. you know, we're not going to change that fundamentally because it never ha it won't happen. Um, but understanding, like, I think there's way greater opportunity to connect people to experiences and create better experiences than we even realize now. And so when yeah. I hear like the way you're describing it, putting together a larger puzzle, it's, it makes me excited because again, I was telling you before, I just love people. I love to see people having fun and I love, like, I always love throwing parties. That's like always the thing. And that's the way I think about all this stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so I, it excites me. So enough about me, though. <laughs> um, no, I love it, man. Let me ask you about Ideal Seat since you're launching it today because this is another thing I think is great because a story that I will not bore you or anybody listening with, though, is about the way I used to sell tickets to people um, when I was working in day-to-day -day sales. And it was be like, I'm just sitting there talking to somebody, understanding what they're trying to do, you know, who they're taking. Like, you know, is it you're trying to win a new business deal and the guy has never seen a Yankees Red Sox game? Well, then you don't want to sit in some bleacher seats. You need to get that guy behind first base, right? Or behind the, the third base dugout where the Red Sox would go in if he's a Red Sox fan, right? Or if you're all taking your family and it's like one of the only events you're going to get to deal because you've been traveling a lot. That's a different experience. And right. so if I'm not mistaken, Ideal Seat uses technology to help solve for some of that. Yep. Um, you know, is, am I wrong or am I right? Or can you explain it to people so that like they hear it from you, not me? Yeah, no, that's, it's, it's so perfect. You know, so when I, I talked about us launching Bandwagon in the beginning and making a ticket marketplace that helped fans 
protect home field advantage and really have a better experience, we were Ideal Seed's first paying customer. Uh, so back in 2016, uh, the press release was released um, where Bandwagon and Ideal Seed entered a partnership to not only help uh, fans get a better understanding of where they were sitting, but they could actually sort on our ticket marketplace like a family friendly section or seats in the shade. And we thought that was huge. And so we became customers of theirs. But when we pivoted in 2017, we were no longer customers. And so we were just rooting for, you know, Joel and Spencer and Adam and the whole team. And so we just always stayed in touch and said, let's find ways to collaborate, make introductions. Um, and earlier this year, we had an opportunity to acquire them. Um, and for us, as I said, we were looking at, like, how can we continue to build out tech to help make experiences better for everyone? And so we acquired Ideal Seed and put it into what we just recently launched today, which is a white label ticketing platform, which um, in short, it is 100% an Eventbrite competitor. Um, our goal is to make sure that anyone who would be most likely to consider having an event hosted on Eventbrite uses us instead because we want it to be personalized and so it matches your branding. We want you to own the data outright, unlike what's happening today where Eventbrite owns your data if you host it on there. We want you to have some of these various features. And so when we acquired Ideal Seed, it was like, this is perfect. We're going to not only be able to um, use this technology that they've been building for years, but now given all that's going on with COVID-19, we're seeing, as, as we talked about earlier, like build the product and let people tell you how it works. We had folks in our private beta who were churches in Trinidad that were using our tech to help control capacity so that they didn't have too many people in the church during COVID-19 to help make sure from a safety standpoint. Or we have a small private school that their business isn't ticketing, obviously, but they need to figure out a way to efficiently host a virtual gala or a virtual event. And so they didn't want to send their customers, their parents and so on, to Eventbrite where they're seeing all these other competing things. They were able to have a simple branded product on their website that allows them to do it. And so not only were we able to work with great people like Joel and his team to get the technology under the bandwagon roof, but we were able to listen to customers and say, well, we think that it's going to be used for this, but customers tell us what you want. And now we've got different folks who are using it. So now it's available for public beta so that we can get more of that feedback and build in the features that folks actually want. Yeah, no, it's exciting. It's a great tool. It's even better because now I know where I, what I will use for all my workshops because I would usually use Eventbrite. Now yeah. I know like uh, that was a shameless plug that you didn't even ask for that I will totally <laughs> use <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, Ideal Seat exactly. for my workshops from now on. That's, yeah. you know, uh, whenever I can go do them again. <laughs> yeah. well, listen, this virtual ones too, man, it's been so interesting. I think that there's a challenge that we're stuck on is that like, you know, we as humans create, you know, we crave this connection. And so while we can't get out in person as much as we'd like to, there's a lot of Zoom fatigue. And so it's like, how can you, um, or video conference fatigue, not to, to pick on Zoom, but I think that there's opportunities to make some really, really unique things. There's, you know, <clears throat> there's a different companies that have had uh, really unique experiences where they will drop off like a box of like cocktails or mocktail mm -hmm. mixer. You can make your drink and then you'll have a keynote speech or, you know, we, you deliver some coffee to some folks and say, brew it, we're going to start at 9 a.m. and we'll do a video conference. I think there's a lot of opportunity for uh, folks to figure out ways to connect with their customers, mm -hmm. even until they can't see them in person. I think that, um, you know, as long as a lot of us are thinking creatively, we can figure out ways to, to make these experiences pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Now, this is one, too, that I didn't know you were going to use the example of coffee or um, baking things here. But I, so but you'll appreciate this because um, my partner, Catherine, uh, she's probably a, a better marketer than I am. Don't tell her I said that, but I'll, <laughs> I'll tell everybody here that. Um, but she, So what her and her team actually did was they had a um, – virtual bourbon tasting and so like they picked mm -hmm. out a special selection uh they worked with a special um a liquor store here in dc and they mm -hmm. like went through like a, a special barrel program and they created a special barrel aged bourbon uh that they sent to all their um, prospects and customers and they oh. did a, an online uh, bourbon tasting yeah and so That's it was like awesome. really really cool so there, there's there's awesome. exactly definitely great ways to engage with people i, I think it's um Completely, like I think creativity has always been a, uh, a differentiator, and I think even more so now because if you don't, you know, if you just expect to throw up a Zoom call or just connect with people over the Zoom, who cares, right? It's like yeah. um, 
you know, the, the dirty, I mean, it's not dirty secret. It's like one of the nice things about doing something like this is the way I'm able to connect with people, right? Uh, you know, or do any of the stuff, right? It, it, it's just okay. because, it, number one, maybe I hold up my end of the bargain by being somewhat intelligent. But number two, it's like I make it fun for people. And then number three, it's like a little different than just sitting and looking at the Brady Bunch of boxes. <laughs> all yeah. over the thing. You know what's so funny is that, you know, we think about like how great of an experience we have when we go to these uh, live events. My wife, um, you know, she's she's super like, I will go to sporting events if you're there. Like she wouldn't like independently go, but she would love to go when we go. And she, we've been in boxes or sidelines, so she's had really great experiences. And so the bar for her, if she's going to go to a sporting event, is very high. But if you think about what we're all experiencing with, do I talk about video conference fatigue? Like the bar is exceptionally low. Mm -hmm. And so the ability to surprise and delight is really, really easy. There's a startup here um, in Austin called Crafted Cocktails, I think is what it's called. And you can literally send that whole like drink mix to someone. So could you imagine like, hey, look, we're going to have, um, you know, whatever this conversation is. And you got craft, you know, cocktails or mocktails. We're going to send this over. Like it's a little things like that where it's like, oh, I thought this was going to be a regular Zoom call. But now you spent 18 bucks, 24 bucks, and you send it to the 15, 20 people you really want to talk to. You're going to have their attention and they're going to tell other people about you and that experience. And I think that being able to have that kind of um, my, mindset on being able to still surprise and delight in a virtual world not only helps us as we're going to try and like welcome everyone back to getting connected, but it also really is emphasizing like who is really interested in delighting users and creating these custom experiences. And I think you can really see the effort of the different companies and different individuals who are doing it. Yeah. I, I, and the other thing is, is fun. And what we yeah. all need right now is like a little bit of levity and a little bit of fun. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in general, I don't take my, I try not to take myself too seriously. Um, but, you know, um, one of the, I, and now, now we'll get on to the fun part of this thing because then I know you, I have to let you get back to your day here. Um, but I do have the, uh, the, the talking ticket Slack channel, which is like actually really become a place for people to talk about meat and bourbon yeah. <laughs> <laughs> as opposed yeah. to like anything ticket related. Though we do have some tickets going on, but like, so what are you cooking right now? Because you did Cornish yeah. hands yesterday. The Cornish hands yesterday. So my wife, um, who who admittedly we actually talked about it last night, she was always a person who goes to the barbecue restaurant and would get pulled pork. You could put it on a sandwich. You could eat it with the pork with some sauce. Um, but I started making like ribs, like and just you know I've got a big green egg and I'll try and throw it on there. And I've really got it down. Like I've really nailed it. <laughs> and so you know a few months ago she was like, this these are the best ribs I've ever had. And then the ones I made this weekend, she's like, oh yeah, th th this is it. Like you nailed it. I wrote down my notes. I took a master class. I signed up for a master class and like literally have a piece of paper where I'm tracking the temperatures and all this different stuff. And so. Um, I love making ribs and, you know, even just trying to teach myself brisket. Um, but then now I'm trying to push myself to do some different things. So, you know, Cornish hens and being able to, like, see, you know, they're smaller versions of, you know, the whole chicken. And then I want to prepare myself to do a whole turkey um, for Thanksgiving. So the plan for everyone listening who, who wants to show up um, is to do a smoked jerk, Jamaican jerk turkey uh, for Thanksgiving. And so I'm like, if I start at the Cornish hen and then work up to the full chicken – and then eventually get to the big, the big turkey. So that's that. <laughs> um, and then of course I'm trying to like be a little better with vegetables. So um, I made some like sweet potato French fries on the grill the other day. Or last night I made some um, roasted parsnips. I chopped those up with some carrots. So yeah, man, I think that uh, at the cost of these damn things, like you got to make sure you're using it. But at the other time, I can justify eating just about anything because I think that it's like quote unquote healthy because it's not fried. So yeah, I love to throw on some food on there. I'm I'm open to any recommendations that you got for me. Yeah, we have like we have a lot of fun with that thing, with with all the meats because yeah. th there's pictures of the meats and like um, somebody posted it like they took one of your recipes you shared with them and did it yeah. over the weekend. It's like it's pretty funny that it's become this big meat meat fest. So yes, um, exactly. we're sorry if you don't eat meat because it's like <laughs> you get overwhelmed with it in the. Uh, we're working on some vegetables. We're gonna figure out some cool stuff to do. I actually want a virtual cooking contest contest uh during COVID-19 and so yeah man there's all kinds of random cool things I, I love food personally because I think it brings people together um and that's one of the things where you know you're breaking bread with people from different backgrounds and different cultures and who's you know who's happier than a, than a full person who's eating some delicious food amongst friends well that, to me this is like the um the worst part about the whole pandemic has been like the ability not the inability to like just go hang out with people 
uh, yeah. have a snack and have a drink. Um, yeah. You know, with like somebody because you know it's um, I'm doing a survey and Derek Palmer. I don't think he'll mind me tell, saying this. He was like, well, uh, you know, the question was like, well, where do where do you? What's the most valuable? place to learn from me and he goes in the bar <laughs> and it's I like just Derek. yeah and it's just I like, like derek and i owe derek a phone call so yeah that's that, that sounds on brand i owe him a call too so it's fine but he was like no, in the bar and it's like so great because now i know that you love bourbon probably as much as i do yep. um what are you drinking right now and then i'll even i'll be i'll, I'll, I'll tell you what i'm drinking yeah, so um, so I'm a big Bullet bourbon. That's my go-to. Mm-hmm. Um, Bullet actually had a uh, Blender Select zero uh, zero one, which was uh, created by a black woman. I can't remember her last name, but her first name's Ebony. Um, and so I was really looking at like, okay, Bullet Blender Select zero zero one uh, was created by a black woman in the space, and I was like, oh, well, what else is out there? Uh, then one of my friends, his name's Chaz, put me on to Uncle Nearest. Have okay. you heard this story? No, Uncle I haven't Nearest? heard that. So from so I don't want to butcher it, but from my understanding, Uncle Nearest um, was the black man who actually uh, was part of the creation process of Jack Daniels. And so Jack Daniels, as you imagine, is super well known. And so now the family, it's run uh, and owned by a black woman, uh, now has their own brand. And it's so smooth. I think I have their, like, it's 1884, um, and they have 1856, I think, in another year. But yeah, it's it's fantastic. So between Bullet Bourbon Select... Um, and then Uncle Nearest, those are my top two. And, um, yeah, I mean, other than that, if I want to get kind of fancy, I'll have like a Hibiki or something like that. But, uh, I love to make a nice craft old fashioned. I've got the little large, you know, the large ice cubes and all that stuff at home. So I, I will, I will dress up a drink for myself at home with no shame after we finally get the kid down. Because if you're a parent going through all this craziness, like, you deserve all that you are allowing of yourself. So, you know, don't beat yourself up. Give yourself some vacations as you can and uh, enjoy that cocktail or mocktail if you want to. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. I'll have to look for Uncle Nearest. And I want to plug uh, my neighbor. It has the only distillery or maybe it was the first distillery in D.C. So I've been Ooh. drinking this 1-8 Untitled and it has like a hint of cherry cola to it. And it's, okay. it's really – it's got some little heat. About, it's you- about uh, – it's 128 proof or something, so it's like a little. It's up there. It's nice though. That sounds fantastic. I will have to figure out a way to get some of that. I mean, that reminds me with me being from the Carolinas of Ch- cheer wine. Are you oh. familiar with cheer oh wine? cheer wine? Yeah, of course. So, I gave it to my son know. the last time we were driving through, and he's like, "This stuff is amazing." <laughs> no one even knows about it, so he should. <laughs> your your neighbors should start saying it has hints of cheer wine. And it would he would blow up in the Carolina market. That, that's awesome. All right, so um, I think we did the thing. Um, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna put you on the spot one more time. So why is Alabama better than Clemson? No, I'm joking. Well, <laughs> I'm I, joking. I that, uh, <laughs> two historic teams. I think we are set to win the next one. Uh, so you oh, know, we'll see about that. Of football right now. If if we take the field, hopefully right? we have. Yeah, hopefully we get it to a point where we can have it. Because yeah. now that I, now that we know, now that we know each other so well, it would be fun yeah. to have a bet going. Um, Listen, running bet, running for the next several quarterback. We just made an offer to another QB out of Tennessee. I'm excited. Yeah, no, it's been it's been great. It's been a great rivalry. Uh, Harold, where do I point everybody to find out more about what you're working on? Uh, check us out um, on bandwagonfanclub.com, and you can follow me. I am all over the Twitter. Twitter is my favorite social network. I'm not big on LinkedIn. Sorry, LinkedIn users. So I am one bandwagon fan. That's O N E bandwagon fan on Twitter. And you'll see my antics, my food, and startup um, story because I think you've got to share as much as you can. The, I'm very well aware of the transformative power of transparent storytelling. So feel free to check me out and learn a little bit more about what we've been building at Bandwagon. No doubt. And thank you so much for doing this. Thanks, brother. I appreciate you. Thanks for the time. What did you think of my conversation with Harold Hughes from Bandwagon? Let me know. Send me an email, daviddavewakeman.com. You can check out my website, too. It's DaveWakeman.com. You'll find my blog. You'll find all kinds of stuff that I'm up to. I try to keep it updated regularly. You know, it's a great place to find stuff about me. Make sure you connect with me on the social media. I'm Dave Wakeman on the LinkedIn. I'm also at David Wakeman on the Twitter. Um, if, like I've said for, this is probably 118, 119 episodes now, if you know the guy with the at Dave Wakeman Twitter handle, I would love it. He hasn't tweeted since 2010. That's a decade. Give it to me. I need to be on brand. Uh, make sure you check out my friends at the We Will Recover Project. That's 
put together by Martin and Anar, um, www.wewillrecover.live. It's going to be great. Um, there's ideas. There are webinars. There are blogs. There are frameworks. There are checklists. There are all kinds of things that are focused specifically on getting you back on your feet. Okay, so we will recover dot live. Make sure you visit the I voted concerts dot com page. Make sure you if you're in America that you're registered to vote. If you can donate some time or some money or some energy or something to the efforts, do it. But most importantly, make sure you're registered to vote and make sure you vote. Okay, if you vote, you can take a selfie, you send it in to the website, you get a concert. So with some kind of cool band, right? It's going to be great, okay? Can't do it in person this year, so we're going to do it virtually. It's an amazing project. It's an amazing effort. Americans vote less than most other industrialized countries, so make sure we change that this year. It's super important in every election that people vote. It's the cheapest ticket to keep in our democracy. Visit my friends at Booking Protect. That's www.bookingprotect.com. Uh, great, great stuff going on there about recovery, about relationships, about revenue. Kieran has been running the Instagram page. I had been saying it was Sophie, but I had been corrected as Kieran. He has been running the social media page on Instagram, and he's been doing a great job. So if you're on Instagram, follow, give the Booking Protect folks a follow. Um, connect with them on LinkedIn. You know, do the whole deal. But make sure you bookmark the blog, right? It's www.bookingprotect.com forward slash blog. Uh, there's stuff for me there. There's stuff, a uh, really great article recently from Kat Spencer on building and rebuilding relationships after the pandemic. Um, Sophie's been working on some stuff around lessons learned and best practices and things that you can take out of the pandemic that are going to be valuable to you going forward. Um, it's a really, really great resource and I can speak for all of us and we're going to make sure that there's still great, great stuff going on there. Make sure you check out me. I mean, you got in this far. We're a minute, an hour and seven minutes into this podcast, but get my Talking Tickets newsletter on Fridays. It is at talkingtickets.substack.com. It is five stories from the week with a little analysis, some action items, some insights. Uh, it's the most valuable thing I think I do all week long um, because it makes me really read, stay in contact with stuff, and pay attention, which can be tough in a world like we live in right now. So talkingtickets.substack.com is where you get the newsletter. It's great. It's free. Do it. Finally, I want to thank you so much for being here. Um, I started redoing the podcast in July because I didn't know how to, what or who or how to talk to people before then because I didn't know what was going on. I still don't know exactly what's going to go on. But I have committed myself to the Stockdale Paradox, which is something I've talked to Simon Mab about a couple times. Um, you know, he's the one who reminded me of this thing, which is that we know this is going to go on. We know it will end. We don't know when it will end. We don't know how. We know it's going to suck. But that means that we have to commit to keep moving forward. And that's what I'm doing. And that's what I hope to be for you. I hope to be a resource and an asset to you as you move forward. I'm going to have a couple of really cool things, I think, to, answer, to announce for you in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, but I want you to keep moving forward. If you need somebody to talk to, send me an email. It's dave at davewakeman.com. I love to hear from people. I love to know what's going on. But more importantly, if you really need somebody to talk to, I want to be that resource for you. Um, I know how tough it can be. So send me an email, daviddavewakeman.com. As always, I really am so grateful for people to give me a little bit of time in their ears. Um, it means the world to me that you pay attention to the work I'm doing, the ideas I'm sharing, the people and conversations I bring to you. Um, it, I couldn't do it without you. I mean, that goes without saying. Customer first is kind of my gig, and um, you are more than customers, your friends and family and colleagues. So until next time, thank you so much. And I'll talk to you soon. Also tell me what you thought of the new microphone for the intros. Um, soon the conversations will be recorded with the new microphone. It's going to be great. And then I'm going to get new technology, but until next time, thank you again. Okay. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Take it easy.